Good evening. I'm Joe Holder, pastor of Little Zion Primitive Baptist Church in Bellflower, California. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're thankful to have you with us and encourage you to have your Bible and, if you'd like, notebook and follow along. We'll be studying in Hebrews chapter 3 this evening. I give the title to tonight's message, God's Long Suffering. Are we provoking God or honoring God? Let's begin with a good hymn. Our country has gone through a lot of chaotic turmoil in the last year and it in a particular way culminated today to the chagrin and disappointment of some and to the celebration of others. As a pastor I regard myself and try to conduct myself in an apolitical manner. Uh, I have to register one way to vote but in in my interaction with church people, I try to not not divulge red or blue, rather uh, higher or, or more significant issues that I believe believers in Christ need to focus on in terms of civil government. I'd actually like to read a couple of verses from 1 Timothy chapter 2 regarding the Christian's obligation and responsibility toward civil government in the New Testament era. This is straight from the Word of God, not my opinion. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that... The word that is translated from a Greek word which defines purpose. This is the reason for our prayers, intercessions, and supplications, and so on. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Paul didn't write one thing whatever about that we may that our political party may win and the other lose. He didn't write about various political agendas or political philosophies. The Christian's objective in praying for civil government is very focused, and it's focused on our faith and our faith life with God and with his people, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life not be persecuted, not be interfered with by civil authority, and that we may do that in godliness and honesty without the interference of civil government. Our country has been uniquely blessed for over 200 years that in large part we have been blessed so that 
that perhaps we here in this country have neglected more than we should have to be prayerful in this way for our government. I encourage you in the days ahead to pray for our new government and under its new leadership, whether you like them or not, whether you voted for them or not, pray for them and pray for them always with this specific biblical objective in mind. Whether you like everything they do or not, pray that their conduct in governmental affairs and regulations will be such that we as Christians may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. Let's now go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for today, for the blessings of life and the goodness that you daily send our way. We thank you for having this opportunity that we can peacefully and with our hearts focused on you gather around this medium and turn to your word and seek what it teaches us to, to believe and to live in our witness and testimony of our faith to others around us and to you. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings you send our way, for the, the routine blessings of sunrise and sunset, of respectable weather. Thank you for the unusual blessings, despite all the chaos of the isolation of the last year. We have abundant food and security and rest. You have been good to us, and we thank you for it. We pray, Father, for the new government in our country, that whatever they do in whatever direction they take, they would protect and respect the, the institutions of Christianity, ours and others likewise, that we may, as Paul directed us to pray, lead a quiet and peaceable life, honoring you without fear of intervention or interference from government. We pray for those increasingly affected by COVID. Uh, just heard this evening of a good elder on the other side of the country who was hospitalized in the last 24 hours with severe symptoms from COVID. And we pray your protective providence to be with him and his family who are also suffering it. We pray for the same blessing on all of those so impacted by the virus. We, we need your help and your, your mercy and your goodness so, so much in this hour of need. We thank you for blessings past. We thank you for blessings future because you've promised them and we believe your promise. Bless us now as we turn to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I was talking with Sandra this evening about my passage in Hebrews chapter 3, and she indicated that often, in fact, about every time when she tries to read the book of Hebrews, she finds great difficulty. It's like she suddenly is reading about another world and another culture entirely. Factually, that is exactly what is the case. Most of the letters in the New Testament were written at least to congregations of believers composed of both Jew and Gentile, and in some cases predominantly Gentile believers. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of Christian Jews. They had been worshiping God in the synagogue, going to the temple on the, the religious holidays, as all of the other Old Testament worshiping Jews had done for generations. They heard the message of Jesus and they believed him. As was the case with Jews converting to Christianity in the first century, they were subjected to severe uh, persecution and rejection by their friends and family in, in, their, in their family and in their culture. They were literally just completely outcast and, and shunned uh, completely. And so after so much of this has gone on, they're tired, they're discouraged. Based on the closing verses of chapter 10, 
they're literally contemplating giving up their faith and going back to the synagogue. This is a grave issue, and I believe the Apostle Paul was the writer of the Hebrew letter. He wrote to these people because he loved them. He had lived what they were going through. He understood the persecution. He understood the, the dynamics of what they were suffering. And so he writes to give them all the reasons why they should not abandon their faith and go back. Let me give you a, <clears throat> we'll be focused on chapter 3, but let me give you just a brief build up to chapter 3 as we see it unfolding in the Hebrew letter uh, to, to get to that point. Chapter 1 describes some of the loftiest language and some of the loftiest blessings of the ages in, in its wording. It starts with a reminder that our God spoke in many different ways to his people in the ages past, but he reserved his best speech for now when he spoke to his people in the language of his son. Even though Paul wrote with different personality and different uh, literary style, his belief, his conviction of truth was exactly the same as John's. So where John would speak of Jesus as the word, Paul here speaks of God speaking to us through his son. And that means that Jesus is not only the language of God to his people, Jesus is the message of God to his people. He spoke in the brightness of his glory and came in the express image of his person. He was God in human flesh, and that is the message of God to us. And as a reminder, Paul will tell us in chapter 1 that Jesus is not the superior or the, the supreme angel in God's creation. Jesus is better than angels. He's not an angel. He is God in human flesh. The closing verses of chapter 1 are the, is the only place in the Bible where angels are literally defined. So when, if, you're, if you think angels are a mystery, read those closing verses and you'll find the inspired definition of what angels are, and it's a great blessing. Then in chapter 2, Paul will begin with an admonition. In fact, chapters 2, 3, and 4 begin with a very structured admonition to his readers. And we'll, Lord willing, cover two of those this evening. After the admonition, Paul goes into the details of Jesus, not the superior angel, but he who was greater than angels, who for a brief moment became lower than angels so he could suffer death for his beloved family. Then Paul goes into great detail describing in one biblical analogy after another the victory that Jesus accomplished for his people. We close then from chapter 2 and move into chapter 3 where we will begin tonight. The focus of my message tonight will be on Jesus, the apostle of our profession. Paul begins chapter 3 with an admonition that we consider Jesus both the apostle and high priest of our profession. Chapters 1 through the about half of chapter 3 or chapter 4 deal with Jesus as the apostle of our profession. Beginning in the ending of chapter 4 and through chap uh, about half of chapter 10, he develops Jesus, the priest of our profession. And then from the last half of chapter 10 to the end of the book, it's a weaving of both, but primarily admonitions based on the combination. So our focus tonight will be specific. Let's look briefly at this first admonition in chapter 2. I'll read the first four verses. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. What are the things we have 
heard. Go back to chapter 1, verse 2. God has spoken to us by his Son. We have heard the message of God spoken by his Son. We ought to give the more earnest heed to what we have so heard. Paul's not talking about a, a preacher or a, a, a loving believer in your family. He's talking about the message we see in the in the language, the, the vocabulary of God in Jesus, his son. For if the word spoken by angels would steadfast, the word of the law given on Mount Sinai, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, such a powerful and important message, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Jesus teaching and speaking in his public ministry in the four Gospels of our New Testament is the word spoken by him, God speaking to us in his Son, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, John, for example, God also bearing them witness with both signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Paul raises the question, how shall we escape? There is a judgment involved in ignoring the teachings and the commandments of Jesus. He will go into that judgment in great detail in chapter 3, where we'll be focusing much of our time. And it is that judgment that Paul, I believe, is here referencing. We'll deal with it in greater detail as we go into chapter 3. Then we go to the beginning of chapter 3 and the beginning of our primary passage this evening. Wherefore, holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Wherefore is a connective word that grammatically points back to reasoning and information contained in prior writing in this document. So Paul is sending us right back to chapters 1 and 2 and says, because of everything you have learned that I have written in chapters 1 and 2 about Jesus, we should consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our profession. Holy brethren, who are these people to whom Paul writes? He describes them for us. Holy brethren, they are believers in Jesus. They're presently discouraged. They're contemplating giving up their faith, but they are believers, and it's breaking their heart to think about this move. Study carefully and put yourself in their shoes as you read the description of their suffering for their faith in Hebrews 10, verses 32 through 39. He further describes them as partakers of the heavenly calling. It's not just a they're not bystanders thinking about the faith. They are participants. They are partakers of this calling. The word partakers is defined by Lau and Nita, New Testament Greek Dictionary, as one who shares with someone else as an associate in an enterprise or undertaking. We are in our faith, in our faith life, participants with and associates with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6, 1, Paul will say that we are, uh, we are to work, we are workers together with Jesus. We work with him in our discipleship, in our walk of faith. So we are partici participants, our associates with Jesus in the faith way, and in the faith way, he tells us what he is directing. His objective in writing these words to us, consider, think carefully and closely. This is not a casual hobby religion. This is not a passing thought. Contemplate, weigh, uh, analyze, think ponderously and carefully about this topic, this person whom we are to look at as the 
author and finisher of our faith, as he will say in chapter 12. An apostle is a special messenger, in this case, sent from God, as John described him in chapter 1 of the his gospel, the word of God, the word that was with God and was God. In chapter 1 of Hebrews, verses 1 and 2, God spoke to us in his Son and described the Son in language suitable and fitting to John chapter 1. He's the high priest of our profession. He represents his people and our sins and our sin problem with God the Father. He offered himself to the Father for the sins of his people, and the Father accepted. He, the angel told Joseph that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Verse 2. And, but let me preface my thoughts here. Paul will, for several verses, draw a contrast and comparison between Jesus and Moses, who was faithful to him that appointed him, Jesus. In Revelation 19, verse 11, Jesus is named faithful and true. He is so faithful and so true, he carries the name. He was faithful to him that appointed him to the Father, as Moses was faithful in all his house. However, there is a contrast between Jesus and Moses that we see beginning in verse 3. For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house." For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. He's greater than Moses. Moses built his house, and in verse 5, he will be described as a servant who, who built his house under the commandments of God. But Jesus was not a servant in his house. He was the builder of the house. He is God. That's the reference in verse 4. He who built the house is this house is God. Verse 5 and 6. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over, not a servant in, his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Moses was a faithful servant. His service, the law, was prophetic of Jesus. What he, what he gave us in the law in the Old Testament is prophetic of Jesus. And Paul will go through over half of the book of Hebrews to give us the vivid reality of that that typology of Jesus the priest compared to the Le Levitical priest of the Old Testament. But Jesus, the son over his house. I, an observation that I believe, make this a little anchor in your thoughts, if you will. What Jesus taught by his abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches in John chapter 15 verses 1 to 9, and what John taught by his admonition in 1 John to abide in Jesus, Paul taught by Jesus the apostle of our profession and the son over his own house. In John 15 verse 8, when Jesus was completing this I am the vine, you're the branches, abide in me and be fruitful. He described the objective, so shall ye be my disciples. Abiding in Jesus and being fruitful is not the means by which we become children of God. It's the means by which we become faithful and blessed disciples of Jesus, fruitful to the glory of of our Savior and the head of our house, Jesus. And so what
Paul is teaching here is not about salvation and going to heaven when we die. It's about discipleship, being faithful and fruitful, being truly his disciples. As with Jesus and John in those lessons, Paul here is describing our place in his house is contingent, not an absolute, not an irresistibly decreed relationship if we keep our confidence and hope steadfastly. And Paul will repeat this point in verse 14. If we hold fast, hold on to what we already possess, it's not gaining something we don't have, but hold on to what we do have steadfastly and faithfully. This is discipleship, not salvation. The word confidence in this verse is defined and was translated from a word which de describes or defines a state of confidence or boldness often in the face of intimidating circumstances. <laughs> Put 2020 by that little description of intimidating circumstances. My, my, what a crazy year we had. And rejoicing is not the emotion of joy, but the reason for that rejoicing and confidence, the substance that causes the joy. And Jesus, an abiding faith in him, is the foundation for both our confidence and our rejoicing firm to the end. There's no time, no circumstance, no condition for giving up as these Hebrew Christians were contemplating. Not COVID, not crazy politics, nothing justifies giving up on Jesus and giving up on our faith. Nothing whatever. In chapter 6, verse 1, Paul describes leaving the foundation and building on that foundation, let us go on unto perfection. What do we build on this foundation that Paul has laid for us? What are we building today? Then we go to verse 7, and Paul here will introduce an Old Testament passage from Psalm 95. He will devote the remainder of chapter 3 and the first portion of chapter 4 out of this admonition section of Hebrews, this one lesson covers most of the ink in that entire section. So Paul is building a really foundational truth for us in this testy, intimidating circumstance to remind us of the gravity of our faith and our service to the Lord. I'll first read from, from Paul, and then we'll read Psalm 95, the same uh, lesson from the Old Testament. Verses 7, 8, and 9. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, a, a reference to Psalms, the Holy Ghost is responsible for the writing of the Psalms of, the, of all of Scripture. Today, right now, this is a today passage, not a when you die and go to heaven after a while passage, it's a today, right now passage. Today, if contingency, he's already introduced that contingency above, he stays with it as he goes into this, this dominant lesson. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. This references the, the forty days of rebellion at the, on the borders of Canaan and God's judgment falling upon the unbelieving and fearful Israel, measuring a year for a day, and they, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that fearful, unbelieving generation died and a new generation that believed God and trusted him more fully was ready to go in and possess that land. 
This is a quote, one of the longest quotes in the New Testament from the Old, from Psalm 95, verses 6 to 11. O come and let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. The activity is not going to heaven when you die. It's an activity that prepares us and equips us to worship God. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, the, the, the admonition is strong and distinct. It's an admonition to God's people to be faithful and bold in their trust and belief in God and to worship. It acknowledges He's our God. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation. Here we see the long suffering of God and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. To whom did God speak these words? Originally, he frames the lesson to that first generation of people, who rejected and then left and God judged and sent to the wilderness. And then as David writes the words many generations later, he again applies the words to them. And by the way, we won't get to it tonight, but in the beginning of chapter 4 of Hebrews, Paul says there's a promise left to us of entering into his rest. Be fearful that you do not enter that rest. So all of this is written for us now for an abiding rest that we are to enter into. And this is not a one day in seven rest. This is a lifelong rest, 24-7, seven days a week. Again, to whom spoken, the same generation that escaped from Egypt under the protective cover of a lamb's blood. They had been de delivered from slavery by the blood of the Passover lamb. They were God's people, but they failed to honor him. So can we. Underscore verse 12. We'll hopefully get to it tonight. They fell into grievous unbelief because of fear. Read the lesson of the spies who went in and spied out the land and came back and reported to Moses and the people. Except for Joshua and Caleb, all of those who went in and came back afraid of the giants they saw in the land. Fear can today in you and me stir profound unbelief. Beware. It also brings, as this lesson teaches us, grievous chastening. God refused to allow these fearful, unbelieving people. They were his people covered by the Lamb's blood, but they turned back in fear and unbelief, and he said, they will not enter my rest. He didn't say, they will not enter my heaven. They will not enter my rest. By the way, uh, as an underscoring point that, that this lesson is dealing with discipleship, with temporal issues and not eternal salvation, Canaan in Scripture is not a type of heaven, but a type of serving God faithfully here and now. Consider the contrast that, that distinctly makes it different from what we shall enjoy in heaven with the Lord. Israel, when they went into that land, had to fight to drive out their enemies. They had enemies there. We'll have no enemies in heaven. They had to labor to keep it. They could only possess what the sole of their foot walked upon. 
and they had to labor even then to maintain it. And they lost it by their own sinful ways and unbelief. They were often vagabonds and strangers in their homeland because of their unbelief. Their challenge, what caused them to respond, of uh, the, the, the majority of the spies, the witnesses who went in, was a fierce occupying people, giants. They said, to Moses and the people, they were such powerful, dominant people that, that we felt like grasshoppers in their presence. What's our challenge today? What, what giants have we faced in the last 12 months? We faced a giant called COVID that, that people of our generation nowhere in the world have ever faced just like it. It's, it's been different and, and intimidating and, and full of pressure and, and difference. We have faced social and political chaos in our country, and it has all had some effect on us. We can't ignore it. And even in our isolation uh, for COVID protection, we can't ignore all that has gone on around us. During this challenging time, as we have witnessed the giants in our land, have we honored God during this last year? Have we held fast our confidence and our joy, our rejoicing in hope, or have we faltered because of fear, lost our confidence and our rejoicing, and obsessed over fear or anger? Have we provoked our God, or have we honored him as Lord over his own house? And by faithfully holding fast our hope and rejoicing, have we lived up to being part of that house? What did Israel do during these 40 days and 40 years? They tempted God, he says, this word tempt means to put to the test, to prove. These people, after a miraculous delivery from slavery in Egypt, they were arm, unarmed slaves. They weren't soldiers, and yet God delivered them from the most intimidating and powerful nation and army in the world at that time. And then... He delivered them across the Red Sea by a miracle and through the wilderness to the borders of Canaan. And yet they, after all those exhibits of God's deliverance, they think they need to put God to the test as if they have no basis to know whether or not he will stand by them or whether he's able to deliver them. They proved God they, this word means to attempt to validate genuineness by examination and testing. They needed to, to prove whether or not God was genuine. What's going on with these people? They questioned their God's genuineness. The God who, who sent the plagues on Egypt, who parted a giant waterway so they could go through dry shod, who delivered them from one adversary after another in the wilderness, and now they have to decide and test whether or not he's genuine. And finally, God reminds them and us of the same thing we have experienced. They saw his work. They were hungry. He gave them manna and quail. They were thirsty. He caused them to have abundant water to drink, even when it came out of a solid rock. They saw, they experienced the miraculous deliverance of God, and yet they tested, tempted, and proved him. After all of those demonstrations of his love and his care, his deliverance, they and we were without excuse. They failed to understand and to give credit to God's loving care and deliverance that he had demonstrated time after time. Instead of honoring him, 
They tempted him. They dared him to do good and ignored every good thing he sent their way. In the end, they provoked him to judgment. It is chastening judgment, but my friends, the Lord's chastening judgment is righteous, but it is severe. What was that judgment? It was not loss of their salvation. It was loss of their rest in Canaan, the land of milk and honey that God promised them. That, my friends, was a spiritual calamity. I've heard believers say, well, if, if you just lose your, your blessing here in time and you still go to heaven when you die, it's no big deal whether you serve God or not. Oh, you, what dream world are you living in, friend? Look at Canaan in this era of their existence. Compare their existence in the land of Canaan, the land that flowed with milk and honey, with God abiding with them and protecting them and feeding them the abundance of milk and honey from the land. Compare that with Israel during those 40 years in the wilderness. Is there any big difference there is a world of difference, and so there is, between the blessings of God when you walk by faith and obey him, hear his voice, and when you tempt, provoke, and test him. You don't want to go that way. Verse 10 and 11, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart. And they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. God was grieved with them. He, he, was, he was angry and, and unhappy with them, and well, he should have been. They err in their heart. They wandered not only in action, but even in their, their heart, their mindset, their allegiance to God. And he said, they have not known my way. They regarded God's path and deliverance as merely one of several optional paths that they were free to choose. <laughs> God's path, another path, who cares? It doesn't matter. God doesn't even care. Where did you find that idea? Oh my goodness, that's toxic. In this, they proved they provoked the God who had commanded them to follow his path only. He describes them as they have not known my ways. Stephen Charnock, in, in probably the, the a two volume set that you can see right behind me on the shelf, right over my white hair, those two volumes of blue you see up there, the title, Existence and Attributes of God. If I had to eliminate every book in my library other than my Bibles, that would probably be the last two books I would give up. They, Charnock, 100, 200 or so years back, wrote a classic that every serious Christian, and you need to be serious to, to read and study him, and you'll have to study him if you read him, he made a powerful point in volume 1, page 413. He cited several passages that use the term known in the same way God used the term in this judgment passage regarding Israel. Amos 3.2, 2 Timothy 2.19, Matthew 25.12, and Matthew 7.23. He interprets know in these verses as equivalent to approval. Israel, in sinful pride, chose not to approve God's commandment and God's ways. Have we regarded God's ways during the last year as optional, that we can take them or leave them? Have we disapproved God's ways and chosen to do life our own way? Or have we approved and followed God in his ways? 
the result in our lives is beyond words to describe. I've taken my time this evening, and this is a good place to punctuate. Let's uh, pick up here next time and see if we can follow through on this powerful lesson. As we contemplate this lesson in the days between now and Sunday, think about you as a believer in Jesus, just as Israel believers in God. Have you, as Paul will say in the next verse, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart in departing from the living God. That's what we do when we choose not to live our life God's way. We doom ourselves to a faith life in the wilderness when the land of Canaan could be our daily joy. That's powerful. Thank you for studying with me. Lord willing, we'll take it up and go further in our next message. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for your blessing on us tonight. Thank you for your loving grace. Thank you for your forgiveness of our folly and our sin. Help us to be serious in our faith, to be respectful of the goodness when we see your works, to believe and to, and to grasp and hold on to the reality that you are you are our loving Father and God. You care and you shall deliver us and be with us in trials so that we can joyfully, confidently trust in you and walk with you and not be afraid of giants in our land as Israel was of old. Help us to be faithful and to find the rest and the blessings of your milk and honey world for us today, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you for studying with me. Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday morning.